Okay, any questions about anything before we start? Any questions? Now, which one of you guys is sitting in the broken chair? Sam? <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, by the way, uh, Kevin Tang and I are communicating about the 3100 prelim versus the 3250 prelim, so you might be hearing something from him one of these days. He did, yeah. I, I said to him, you know, this is what I said. I said, basically, he said, is this critical? And I said, I don't really think it's that critical. I think they, with this much advanced notice, they can deal with two tests in one day. But if it doesn't make a big difference to you, and you did it on Monday, they might like that better. On the other hand, they might not, because you can't please everybody. So ask them. So I think that's what he, he said he was going to do, is going to ask the class what everybody thought, which I think is fair. <clears throat> All right, well, remember what we did last time? We were talking about these uh, applications of modular arithmetic to cryptography. And there's sort of three major ones that I want to talk about. We, we talked about, last time we talked about the, first of all, we talked about the general notion of a, a, an encryption scheme and an associated key. So we had this general notion of an encryption scheme and a key. And a good example of that was a polyalphabetic substitution cipher. Like if you make a big table of cyclic permutations or any kind of permutations of the alphabet and you, your key tells you which permutation to use on which letter in the message. So like when you see an F coming through, it might have been many different things depending on what place it had in the message. And we did the XOR one. We'll come back to that a little later on. And then at the end of class last time, we talked about, uh, well, first of all, we mentioned that the, the, the wall in cryptography pre-1976 was secure establishment of keys because keys are things you have to change frequently and the solution to this problem was this revolutionary proposal by Hellman and Diffie And I'll remind you how that went, and then say a couple more words about it. And some people call it the Diffie-Hellman instead of Hellman-Diffie. Some people call it the key exchange protocol. Some people call it the key distribution protocol. All those things are the same thing. So how does this go? All the members of the community, and when I use the word community here, I, I mean the good guys, a secure communication community, each member of which wants to communicate with other members. All these guys agree on a large prime P. and a base B. Each member picks and keeps private his or her, well, let's use its own E. And what is E going to be? E is going to be something in ZP star. It's some positive integer less than p. And suppose Frodo wants to communicate with Sam. So 
Frodo sends Sam, not this Sam, but you know, Sam Wise Gamgee. Okay, that's his full name, if you didn't know. Frodo sends Sam B to the E sub F, where E sub F is Frodo's E mod P. Sam raises that to E sub S. Or no, Sam receives that. Let me do this in the right order. And sends to Frodo B to the E sub S mod P. Now, Frodo has this, and Sam has that, and each of them raises what he's received from the other to his own E mod P, and that is the key. So Frodo computes K, which is what he got from Sam, B to the ES mod P, to the EF, which he knows, mod P, which is B to the ESEF mod P, and Sam computes that same K, except in a different order. He takes what Frodo sent him, which is B to the F mod P, and raises it to the ES, which he knows, mods out by P. And that's the same thing. And that's their key that they use with whatever encryption scheme they're doing. Why is this good? Well, I'm taking it as given that if a key is hard to figure out, then an eavesdropper is going to have a hard time spying on the communication exchange. So we have to say, why is the K, why is the key hard to figure out here for an eavesdropper? Say Gollum. Gollum's eavesdropping. What does Gollum see? Gollum sees the two things that Frodo sent to Sam and that Sam sent to Frodo. He sees those two things. From seeing just those two things, can he compute K? No, even though Balaj thought he could last time. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. By taking their product, he can't compute K. So Gollum can't find K easily from what he sees, which are B to the F mod P and B to the ES mod P. And the reason he can't find K easily is he would need, he would need to compute mod P logs. And you're going to have to take my word for it that that's hard. It, the complexity grows in essentially linearly in P and therefore exponentially in the number of digits or bits you need to specify P. So complexity is exponential in the number of bits in P. So you pick P big enough, that's a hard problem for Gollum to solve. Given that it's a good scheme in that way, it has two disadvantages, one of which is probably a little more serious than the other. So here's two minor disadvantages, or whatever, two disadvantages. First off, it requires an initial handshake between the users. And before the era of answering machines and email and voicemail and stuff like that, there was no way to sort of send someone a message and just go away, you know, just have it go without having the person be in contact with you. You would have to go like stick a note on their office door or something like that. So it requires an initial quote unquote handshake, this exchange of those two things between the two agents. So it requires an initial handshake. After that, 
once you've established the key, each agent can send messages at will, and they, just like emails. So each agent can send at will without sort of a real-time interaction with the other agent. All right, the second disadvantage is the one that Alex brought up last time, the end of class. And that is that it's vulnerable to what people call a man-in-the-middle attack. And really, to be politically correct, we should say a person in the middle or whatever, but I'm going to say a wizard in the middle. So for example, suppose Saruman, right, wants to spy on Frodo and Sam. So Saruman, or Saruman, however you say it, Saruman, what he does is he intercepts the, the transmissions between Sam and Frodo. So he intercepts, and he doesn't allow these things to go through, B to the EF mod P from Frodo and B to the ES mod P from Sam. And what does he do? He has his, and in, assuming he knows P and B, which he might not, and has his own E, let's call it E sigma to distinguish it from E sub S, so E sigma for Saruman, he then sends B to the E sigma mod P to both Frodo and Sam. And he establishes a key for communicating with Frodo And I'll call that K sub F, which is going to be B to the E F E sigma mod P with Frodo and K sub S equals B to the E S E sigma mod P with Sam. And each of Sam and Frodo thinks he's talking to the other. But really, both of them are talking to Saruman. And Saruman's behaving like Sam when he talks to Frodo, he's behaving like Frodo when he talks to Sam. And so what's going on here is what's called a man in the middle, or a wizard in the middle, or woman in the middle, person in the middle, agent in the middle, whatever, attack. Okay, does everyone see how, that's, how that works? Okay. Well, anyway, this advance, this HDM, this HDM was a major breakthrough. Epic. And everything since that time flows from this, in a sense. And let me just, touch, just stop talking about math for a second and tell you, read you a little passage from a book here. <laughs> it's not about cryptography. Okay, this, this book, remember when I told you that back when I was in grade school, we had something called the new math, where they tried to teach us interesting things like sets and intersection and mappings and, you know, working with like base 7 arithmetic, base 12 arithmetic, modular arithmetic, they even taught us that. And, and that was started in like the mid-60s and it kind of crashed around 1970, because every, most, mostly because there were a lot of parental nervous breakdowns because kids were bringing home homework that their parents had no clue what these things meant. And in fact, there were TV programs on, on PBS trying to explain like base five to parents. 
It was really kind of cool. Anyway, <laughs> it kind of crashed because the kids were not learning simple math anymore. They were, they, they, it was beyond them. And the people who designed this curriculum were really well-meaning people. And they were mostly like people who were like adjunct professors and you know, they weren't like Cornell University type professors. They were professors at like community colleges and stuff who were very interested in secondary education. They tried to get the upper echelons of the math community interested in this, but those folks were like, they were too important to work on this, right? So anyway, Morris Klein, who's a famous historian of math, wrote this book. It's called Why Johnny Can't Add, The Failure of the New Math. And basically, it's a really whiny kind of indictment of the new math saying, these clueless, second-rate mathematicians tried to design a curriculum to teach our kids. But he doesn't ever say, you know, the, the back text is, we big, important mathematicians were too important to work on it. And so basically, the folks who didn't contribute at all whined about, okay, I'll stop whining about him and read you a quote from his book. Okay, this came out in 1973. Okay, so keep that in mind. This Helmand Diffie Merkel was in 1976. And it's a chapter where he's telling about all the useless things that they're teaching these kids today in new math. He says, a third common topic in the new mathematics is the study of congruences. Now, that's, that expression, study of congruences, what he means by that is modular arithmetic. Okay, that's exactly what he means. This subject is frequently introduced by what is called clock arithmetic. Our clocks record up to 12 and then start over again with zero. Thus, if 22 hours have passed from 12 o'clock, the clock will not read 22, but 10. Okay, so that's modular arithmetic, mod 12. This suggests that all numbers be reduced by as many 12s as can be subtracted from them. 22 will be reduced to 10 and is said to be congruent to 10 modulo 12. To make the arithmetic simpler, students are taught congruence as modulo 5 or modulo 6, as if that were any easier than 12. And then he says, now, congruences have no application to science or engineering. They're taught for their mathematical interest. And as a matter of fact, the topic belongs to the theory of numbers, which is a subject pursued primarily for its own sake. And then he goes on and on and on and talks about you know, more and more useless things the kids are learning today and how the subject of congruence has, has nothing to do with reality. No one's ever going to use modular arithmetic for anything. And then boom, two years later, that. Okay, moral of the story, don't whine. Don't whine about people. Don't, don't, uh, don't, don't ever assume that what you're learning in school is not going to be applicable someday. I told to those of you who were in 2200 last spring, I told you a story about having to know how many Maxwell's equations there were and whether they were partial differential equations. Remember that story? You don't remember. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> All right. So anyway, that, that's, that's that. So the next, the next thing I want to talk about is, is something called Shamir's three-pass protocol. But first, I want to talk about this idea of three-pass protocols in general. So, so the next scheme is a so-called three-pass protocol. And the name is suggestive of how it works. And I'll tell you where I first heard about this. It was the early 80s, and there was a guy named Jim Massey who used to be on the faculty at Yale. He had a joint appointment with CS and ECE and math and everything. He was, a, he was very interested in cryptography. And he, one of his slides, uh, one of the early slides in his talk, and I remember I was watching this talk, it was over in the Statler someplace, had a picture of like a big like pirate chest kind of thing, right? With one of those padlock things on the front, right? And the next slide had a lock on it that was one color. I forget what color it was. Say, say it was green. And the next slide, there were two locks on it, a green one and a red one. And the next slide after that, the green one was gone, and it was just the red one. And then there were arrows and going back and forth. And, and he was describing a three-pass protocol for communication. So I'm going to see if, if you guys can guess how it works. I'll give you like that much of a hint. So we'll, we'll, pretend, we'll pretend that this is like the pirate thing, right? And these two paper clips are locks, padlocks. 
Okay, so I'm an agent. I want to communicate with someone in the class. So what I do is I write the message on a piece of paper. Have to think of a good message. Okay, let's see. Okay, and, and this yellow lock of mine, only I have the key to this. Only I have the key to this. And so I put it in the pirate chest and I lock it up. Now, what do I do if I want to send it to somebody? Does anyone, if, if I give someone the blue paper clip and that's your lock that only you have the key with, and keeping in mind that this is called a three-pass protocol, I have the message locked in this pirate chest. You, clever person, okay, William? Yeah. Do you want to you be the blue key guy? Sure. Okay. So, so he has the blue key. What do I do? What do I do with the, the box? Okay, well, you lock it up first. Right. And then you hand it to me. I send it to you across the ocean, whatever. Yeah. And then what do you do? And then I lock it up as well. So he adds his lock to the little padlock thing. Right, so now there's two locks on there. Yeah, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. I know. It takes practice. Send it back. He sends it back to me, and I see. Oh, it's, it's double lock now. I don't have a key to the to the blue lock, but I do have a key to the to the yellow lock. So I take my lock off and I send it back to him. And then what does he do? And now I have the lock to my key to my lock. And, and he I just unlock it. right. Maybe. It's a challenge. We don't have time for this. No. <laughs> and, now, yeah. and now he gets the message. What does it say? Shall not pass. Right. Okay. <laughs> now, you, you don't want to hear that at the final exam, right? So you have to interpret it in a, in a Middle Earthian sense. You know, you can't interpret it. But anyway, I thought, when I saw this talk by Massey, I just thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever seen, honestly. I was like, what a great idea. What a great idea. Because... No one has to share a key. No one has to establish a key. Everyone has their own little private lock and key. And, you know, what a great idea. I just thought it was so cool. I still do. So that's an example of a three-pass protocol. Now, there are good ways and bad ways of implementing a three-pass protocol. So let me describe first a bad way. So now that you know how one of those works, here's a sort of a bad way to implement one of these is as follows. Last time I talked about the, the, kind, the XOR method of, in, of, of encrypting bit strings with a, another bit string as your key. So suppose the messages are bit strings. So, say, the messages are bit strings, and each agent encrypts or, quote unquote, locks the box. If you want to think back to that demo there, by XORing with its and the it here is a relative pronoun referring back to the noun agent, private, key, K. So remember how it works. You, you have the message this long bit string. You take your key and you repeat the key over the bit string. And then you XOR K star, which is the repeated K with that bit string. OK? So anyway, suppose Frodo. wants to send message 
m to SAM by the three-pass protocol. What does he do? He transmits k, k star x, k star f, that's Frodo's key, and I'll use a, a circle with a plus, or a plus with a circle around it for xor, m to SAM. So this looks like a random sequence of zeros and ones to Gollum, right? What does Sam do? Sam Sam sends, he takes his key and stars it, so K star sub S plus what he got from Frodo, back to Frodo. Then Frodo takes his lock off the box. How does Frodo take his lock off the box? Very simple. J. Yeah, he XORs it again by his own key. So Frodo removes his lock. That is to say, he computes KF star XOR KS star XOR KF star XOR M. And the KF stars just cancel, so I get KS star XOR with M, and sends back to Sam. That's the third pass of the three passes. And Sam removes his key by XORing. So finally, Sam computes KS star plus XOR KS star XOR M equals M. And we're done. We've got message M from Frodo to Sam using a three-pass protocol, employing this XOR version of locking the box. Now, why is that a bad way to implement this thing? Okay, let me, let me see if I can, let, let's use the other Alex this time. <laughs> Wouldn't you deal with very easily the wizard in the middle of this instance? By pretending to be, it, it is vulnerable to that attack, yes. But, but there's an e Say that again? OK, you in the back. I don't know your name. Zach. Zach. Uh, is it really easy to tell, like in this case, uh, KS star from the difference between the thing Sam said and the person? Essentially, yeah, yeah that's, that's the problem there. OK, he's got it. So this is one that you don't need Saruman to figure out how to, how to use. You don't need a wizard. Gollum could do this. OK? What does Gollum see? Let's, let's look. Whoops. Wait a second. These boards are getting more and more rickety as time goes on. getting harder to erase now Th that could be there could be two reasons for that one reason is that I'm using the wrong kind of chalk which I'm not because there's actually two kinds of chalk up in the cabinet up there one of them is actually called sidewalk chalk it's the kind of thing that you know you go up and see you know Yamatai auditions whatever you know that kind of thing if you use that on one of these blackboards it's really hard to get off but using this non sidewalk chalk if I'm having a hard time erasing it means I'm writing too hard so I'll try to write lighter so what does Gollum see? He sees the following. He sees K sub F star XORed with M. 
Then he sees, on the return trip, he sees k sub s star, x ordered with k sub f star, x ordered with m. And then he sees k sub s star, x ordered with m, on the third pass. Because that's what Frodo sends back to Sam. So what does Gollum do? I mean, a fourth grader could do this, right? If you XOR the first two things together, what happens? The K sub F stars cancel, the M's cancel, and you've got K sub S star. So you XOR these, and you get K sub S star, right? Everybody understands how XORing a thing with itself just makes a zero, right? It just cancels. And then he XORs this with the third thing he sees, and he gets M. Simple as that. So that's why it's a bad way to compute things. So not good. So what do we do? Well, even though the theory of congruences, modular arithmetic, is absolutely useless and has no application to science and engineering, there's actually a way to use modular arithmetic to make a three-pass protocol that's secure, at least up to the wizard in the middle attack. And that was due to Adi Shamir, so we'll call it Shamir's three-pass protocol. And in, in case you're wondering, Shamir, Adi Shamir, is the S in RSA encryption, which is the last scheme we're going to be talking about. And he's, he's, he's from the Technion, I think, somewhere in Israel. But anyway, he came to Cornell two falls ago, like shortly after we did this part of the class, and he gave a talk at CS. And so half of the ECE 3250 class went over and heard him speak. And it was really interesting because what he was talking about was basically the math behind all the schemes people use is not breakable, still. You know, it's still unbreakable, the, the modular arithmetic math. So the only way to break encryption schemes is break the physics, in a sense. Build chips that have systematic faults in them. And that's essentially what the NSA is trying to get Intel and everybody to do. So that they can, that's the back door. All right? Everybody know what I'm talking about, the, the back door. The government does not want us, anybody, to be able to communicate securely, except themselves. <laughs> OK? That's a scary thought. It's a scary thought. Maybe we'll have Snowden as a guest speaker later in this. Who knows? <laughs> anyway, OK, so Shamir's three pass protocol works as follows All the members of the community, so community members, Agree on a large prime P. Okay? Each community member chooses and keeps private. So these are going to be the padlocks and the ways of unlocking the padlocks its own EF and DF. So E is going to be encrypt, D is going to be decrypt. This is going to be like the lock, and this is going to be like the key. And what are the EF and DF? They are going to be in Z sub P minus 1 star. OK, so they're going to be co-prime with P minus 1. And it turns out it's easy to find such things. And I, I tell you how in the monograph. Satisfying EF DF mod P minus 1 equals 1. Now why, if I pick an EF and ZP minus 1 star, remember what ZP minus 1 star was? It was the set of all things with no common factors with P minus 1. It was also the set of all things that had 
multiplicative inverses mod p minus 1, right? So if I pick an EF and ZP minus 1 star, there is a DF there, such that EF DF mod P minus 1 equals 1. So note EF in ZP minus 1 star implies that EF has a Actually, let's not use, uh, let's get rid of the Fs. I'm, I'm jumping ahead by bringing Frodo in all. So let, let's just get rid of the Fs for now. So each agent, each community member picks its own E and D. In ZP minus 1 star satisfying ED, mod P minus 1 equals 1. Note that E in ZP minus 1 means that E has A. E has a times bar inverse mod P minus 1. And that's just D. OK. So each member has done that. And those are going to be the locks and the unlocks, the locks and the keys for their padlocks. All right, so Frodo wants to send message M to Sam. Assume the messages. Our numbers are positive integers. And you can always model anything as a positive integer. You know, even a sequence of words. There's obvious ways of encoding it, or a bit string or anything. You can you can take a bit string and model it as a positive integer. So if you take, for example, a text message and you turn it into ASCII code and then you figure out what integer that corresponds to, that could be your M. Anyway, so assume messages are positive integers and assume any message M is less than P. And you can, that's, that's not a, a tough assumption to make. It doesn't subtract any generality because you can take messages and chop them up into pieces, each of which was shorter than P. So you can chop up messages if needed. OK, so Frodo wants to send M, message M, which is a positive integer, to Sam. How does that work? So he transmits. M to the EF, that's his E, mod P to Sam. So this is the pirate chest with Frodo's lock on it. Sam puts his lock on the chest. So he takes what he got from Frodo. and computes this. So he computes M to the EF mod P. He does that to the ES mod P. And that's just M to the ES EF mod P and sends that back to Frodo. Okay. Now, what does Frodo do? Frodo has to remove his lock. So how does he do that? This is where it gets interesting. And this is where we have to use a theorem okay, that we, we've already seen. 
So Frodo receives that and removes his lock as follows. He takes this, which he received from Sam, computes that, so it's m to the e s e f mod p. He computes that to the d f, his unlocking thing mod p. Right? And that becomes m to the es times efdf mod p. But how do we choose, how did Frodo choose his e and his d? efdf, and I'll go over to the sideboard here. So EFDF mod P minus 1 is equal to 1. That's how that was chosen. And that means that EFDF is going to be some integer number of P minus 1's, say K times P minus 1, plus 1. Okay? And that's true for some k. That's just what EFDF equals k p mod p minus 1 equals 1 means. So this becomes m to the ES times k p minus 1 plus 1. And this is the same as m to the e s times m to the k p minus 1 mod p. The second factor here, the m to the p minus 1 times k, is equal to 1, it turns out, mod p. Why is that true? Let's see. So note. m to the k times p minus 1 mod p is the same as m to the p minus 1 mod p to the k mod p, because modular arithmetic works exactly like you would like it to work in every way. But what is m to the p minus 1 mod p? That equals 1, because m to the p minus 1 mod p equals 1 by what theorem? By Euler, but also, but the weaker version of Euler actually is all we need here. Fermat's little theorem. And remember that is a special case of Euler's theorem. Accordingly, the thing that Frodo has computed by, I said he's removing his key, he's done exactly that, is m to the k sub s mod p. So thus Frodo's computation yields m to the e s mod p, and he sends that back to Sam, And Sam then removes his key by doing the same thing, raising that, what he got, to the ds. So Sam removes his key, 
same as Frodo did. And let me just show you the steps, and then we'll take a three-minute break. He takes m to the es, mod p raises that to the ds, mod p, that's m to the es ds, mod p, and because he's chosen his e's and d's so that es ds is equal to 1, mod p minus 1, that's the same as m to the sum l times p minus 1, not necessarily the same as Frodo's thing, plus 1, mod p, and that's equal to m mod p, which is just m, because m was less than p. We assume that at the beginning. Hang on, Alex. This, again, equals 1 for the same reason. As for Frodo's thing. Okay, so I saw a couple of hands up. Alex, you were first. That's the first term here, m to the e sub s. Oh, yeah, we're missing an es there. Yeah, uh, that that doesn't make a difference, but let me let me fix it. You're right. Thank you. That'll fix. Yeah, let's take the three-minute break. I'll put the ES in, and I'll point out where we made correction. All right, so, so anyway, that's Shamir's three-pass protocol. It's good for the same reasons that Hellman Diffie-Merkel key establishment is good, because to, to mess with it, you have to compute mod p logarithms. And it's bad for similar reasons. I just noticed that someone left a 1960s laser pointer here. So I can actually point to stuff. Now, let's see, is it a meter or a yard? It's a meter, OK. At least it's not 1950s laser pointer. OK, so this is good because, as for HDM, that means Helmut Diffie Merkel. Breaking the locks requires computing logs mod p. And that's hard even if you know p. And the dis the disadvantage, disadvantages, first of all, remember Hellman Diffie Merkel required an initial handshake, but after that you could send post it notes or whatever back and forth like emails. But here, this is all real time. This is, you know, nothing happens except in a three pass way. You're not establishing a key for future use. So the whole thing. requires, quote unquote, real time engagement between the agents who are communicating with each other and also, again, the agent in the middle attack. I'll use a different is also is also a vulnerability of this one, just like it was for Helmut Diffie Merkel. So Saruman could pretend he's Sam and intercept Frodo's initial locked box, put Saruman's lock on it, 
send it back to Frodo. Frodo would take his lock off it, and then Saruman has the message. So, end of story. Okay, so that's, that's Shamir's three-pass protocol. And the last thing I want to talk about in this, this little piece is so-called RSA encryption, which is pretty much at the core of all the different secure communication schemes we use nowadays. Like pub, pretty good privacy, if you heard of that one, PGP. That was early 90s, came up, people came up with that, and other ones. But anyway, finally I want to talk about this so-called Revest Shamir, same as Adi Shamir above, Adelman or RSA encryption scheme. And whereas Shamir's three-pass protocol, all the keys and locks were private, completely private, in RSA, there's a significant amount of public stuff out there. And everyone has some private information, but because so much out there is, is public and publicly available, it's known as a public key encryption scheme. So it's known as a public key scheme because much stuff is public, but still every agent has some private stuff. Much about the sort of keys broadly interpreted is public, but not all. Okay, so how does this one work? Again, we start with our secure communication community. Every community member picks and keeps private. Okay, now Alex is back. I can show you where I made the changes um, in response to your question. This is, by the way, this is a 1960s laser pointer. Okay, the ES just goes along like a lapdog follower with the K, and it, it doesn't make any difference. Okay, satisfied now? <laughs> All right, so each community member picks and keeps private. Two distinct, they do have to be distinct by the way, large primes P and Q. All right, that's the first step. And So, so far, nothing's public yet. That's coming soon. Each community member also picks an E and a D. And it, the agents pick the E and the D kind of like kind of like the Shamir 3-pass protocol folks pick their E and D. How does this go? So each also picks E and D. And where are these guys going to reside? They're going to reside in Z sub P minus 1 times Q minus 1 star. Satisfy. ED mod P minus 1 Q minus 1 equals 1. So the difference here, the difference in the way the E's and the D's are chosen for this scheme versus Shamir's 3 pass, there you just had sub P minus 1 instead of sub P minus 1 Q minus 1. That's the only difference here. 
And you'll see, you'll see why this is cool as we go through it. The E and the D are going to be kind of like the locking and the unlocking thing for each agent. So finally, each agent publishes its pair E n, where n is equal to PQ. And this pair E n for, for each agent is called its RSA public key, or public RSA key. And all the agents in the community, there's this big directory, it's like a phone book, that every agent has the agent and its RSA key. So E comma N for a given agent is its public RSA key. They're all out there in some big directory. Now, notice that even though the agent publicizes PQ along with E, the agent keeps private its D and also keeps private the P and the Q. So a key fact, key observation, each agent keeps P Q and D, private. It publishes P times Q and E, but it doesn't publish D. Notice that if someone else could figure out the P and the Q, they could also figure out the D given the E. So if an adversary new P and Q instead of just their product the adversary it could easily find D given E but the adversary doesn't know P and Q it only knows P times Q and I told you last time even though the adversary knows that n is equal to p times q, he's tantalizingly close to knowing what p and q are, but it's computationally very difficult to pull that off. So it's hard to find p and q from n even when you know n equals pq. And that's, that's what makes this scheme secure. All right, so how does it work? How, how, do, we, how do people communicate? How does this, in this, this is a fully versatile way of communicating because you look somebody up in the directory and you send them a message and you don't really, you just let it go. It's just like sending an email. And in this case, just like for Shamir's three-pass protocol, we're going to assume we're going to assume that the M, the message is M. Is there something wrong up there that I want? I need to fix. No, you sure. No, seriously. I mean, any like sometimes when there's like a murmuring in the class, there's some really stupid like that exemplarily thing last time, you know, that I had to fix. But uh, there's nothing maximally stupid up there. Okay. All right. So anyway. Again, in this scheme, the messages are going to be positive integers. And we're going to assume they're 
you break them up so that if you want to send a message to somebody who who's, has an n as his n, you, you break it up into things of length n. So suppose messages are so as in Shamir protocol messages are positive integers. Okay, so suppose Gandalf, say, wants to send M to Frodo. Let's, let's not bring in, you know, Aragorn and all those other people. You know, we don't need them for this. What does Gandalf do? Gandalf looks up Frodo's public RSA key. So Gandalf looks up Frodo's RSA key, EF, NF, and sends M to the EF mod NF to Frodo. And then goes off and does whatever Gandalf does. Doesn't have to wait for a reply. He's not establishing a key, so there's no handshaking going on. He just sends this message. You know, he can get off to doing important stuff. So Frodo gets that. How does Frodo figure out M? Frodo raises that thing to his D. And again, it's going to be mod and F. So M to the EF mod N F to the DF mod N F. And that, of course, is just M to the EF DF mod N F. But what is EF DF? EF DF is equal to 1 mod P minus 1 Q minus 1. So, because of that, EFDF itself is some integer number, say L times P minus 1, Q minus 1, plus 1. Accordingly, M to the EFDF mod NF, which is what Frodo is computing, is the same as M to the L P minus 1 Q minus 1 plus 1 mod NF. And now comes the key point. The Euler phi function, or totient function, of NF, so let's put it over here in the thought space. Every now and then we need one of these thought spaces. NF equals PQ. Phi of NF turns out to be P minus 1, Q minus 1. That is easy to figure out. I do it in the monograph, but here's the, here's the hand wavy argument. Phi of NF is the set of all things that are less than NF and co-prime with NF. So the only things that have a factor in common with NF are the multiples of P and the multiples of Q, less than NF. There are Q minus 1 multiples of P, P minus 1 multiples of Q, and 0. Subtract that off from NF and you get this, QED. Okay. So that's more of a tongue-waving argument, I guess. But anyway. So this is easy to show. If I have a second, I'll do it. I just want to finish. I want to make sure we get this in under the wire. So what does that, what does that mean is in the, in the modulo sign there?
So m to the ef df mod nf equals m to the c of nf times m mod nf. And what is m to the phi of nf? That's equal to 1 mod nf. Because this in here is equal to 1 by Euler's theorem. If you take any number, and, and I'm assuming here, I tacitly assumed that m is in z sub nf star. In other words, it doesn't have p or q as a factor. And it, the bigger p and q are, the harder it's going to be for a message to have p or q as a factor. This fails if that doesn't hold. Okay, But, but don't worry about that. That's a real borderline case. So now Frodo has m. And what made it happen was Euler. In Shamir's three-pass protocol, we had all we had to use was Fermat's little theorem because the, the n thing was a p minus 1, or a p. And the phi of it was p minus 1. But here we're dealing with a product of two primes. Okay? And that's how RSA encryption works. Now, here's something that I found kind of interesting. Like, like that movie I mentioned to you, the, the, you guys the other day about Alan Turing, um, the imitation game. I watched that movie like, when was it? Sometime this spring. I was visiting my mom's house in Massachusetts. So we watched this movie. And there's this one scene where he and the woman, whose name I always forget, who is also a, a stellar cryptanalyst, are sitting outside like having lunch or whatever, and they're like talking about math. And she, and she says, you can sort of see the paper, but I haven't zo zoomed in on the paper yet. She says, Euler's theorem tells you that right away. Okay, and I thought, well, that's kind of funny. She pronounced Euler as Euler, right? It's actually Euler. But then I thought a little more about it, and I thought, well, wait a minute now. World War II was in the 40s. And even as late as, like, 1973, like, modular arithmetic had no application to science or engineering. And Hellman Diffie Merkel didn't happen until three years after that. Bottom line is that... Euler's theorem, modular arithmetic, you know, all that stuff, that wasn't even a thing in cryptography in the 1940s. So I'm like, that is like mega editing error or mega, you know, screenwriting error. They, they should not even, you know, cryptanalysts of the 40s should not even be thinking about Euler's theorem or integers or modular arithmetic, anything like that. So, I, of course, I thought, oh, you're so clever, you spotted that, haha. So, I, <laughs> I went online, I went online and, and, I, I typed in something like, uh, like Euler's theorem, imitation game, something like that. And, and sh of course, there's this whole page of you know, clever people who spotted that. And, and s one of them said that he, he slowed the movie down and zoomed in on the page. And on the page, you can actually see something like this. You can see n equals pq. OK, so further sin, not even, not, it's not even that modular arithmetic wasn't a thing back then with cryptography. They're actually looking at RSA. No one had thought of it. <laughs> OK, so, so everyone's going on and on about how this is an anachronism. And, and of course, there were people who talked about how she pronounced Euler. And then this flame war got going between these two people, because one person said, well, probably back then, everyone pronounced it Euler because he wasn't famous yet. No, he was always famous. You know, No, they pronounced it Euler because he was German, and they hated Germans then, and they wanted to pronounce it wrong on purpose, and blah, blah, blah. You know, this, people are just so, you know, they, they so have much, too much time on their hands. You know, what, who am I to say? I'm, I'm going in, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Anyway, but the bottom line is, that's how RSA works. Now, we do have two minutes left, so I can show you why phi of nf is equal to p minus 1 times q minus 1. And then we can call it a day.
So clickbait would be like, you know, 10 anachronisms in the imitation game, you know, from 10 to 1, right? Anyway, let's see. Y is V of PQ equal to P minus 1 times Q minus 1. Well, in CS2800, they have one way of showing you that, right? You showed me last time. But here's another way. V of PQ, P times Q, is the is the cardinal the number of integers, positive integers that are co-prime with P and Q between zero and PQ. And that's equal to PQ minus the ones that have a common factor with PQ. And those are going to be the number of multiples of P that are positive plus the number of multiples of Q that are positive, so these are positive, plus 1 because this is 0. 0 is, is um, Wait. It's 410, so we better, uh, I'll, I'll sh it's in the monograph, I'll show you next time anyway, sorry about that. <laughs>